So, uh, well, thanks, Daniel, for the uh, kind invitation. Um, this invitation came as a result of my intention to um, write an article for the um, special issue that uh, Daniel is hosting of uh, Sintis on um, teleology or teleological theories for the 21st century. Is that correct? Yeah. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So um, he invited me to um, introduce the, the kind of work that I plan to um, write about on that uh, future paper. And um, what I was telling Daniel that um, I'm a philosopher of mind with a background on uh, metaphysics, in fact, medieval metaphysics and Aquinas and Aristotle. Uh, some later stage, I moved on to analytic philosophy and then the problem of mental causation led me to um, study the, the problem of uh, theology. theology. My, uh, for a number of years, my intuition has been that um, um, teleology is a central notion to understand um, not just human behavior, but also uh, mental causation. So if, um, if, I, if I say in any, in any voluntary movement, um, there is an intention. So, and the intention of uh, raising my, my hand is somehow uh, moving, uh, causing physical, physical movement of my, of my hand, my hand goes up. And, um, and every causal theory that I have seen um, usually doesn't contemplate the idea that uh, teleology can be causally active in that movement. So most uh, theories of the um, mind-brain relation just emphasize in some, some way or some other way the role of the brain, but uh, somehow leave out intention. Now, not finding any satisfac satisfactory theory, I discovered the uh, work of uh, Terry Deacon, right? And uh, Terry Deacon is a biologist um, who works at the University of Berkeley in California, who has a background in semiotics and birth theory. And um, I read this book. This book is actually quite big and uh, in a sense uh, difficult to, to read. So um, some way the learning curve is high, but uh, what I found there is very interesting because I found there a theory of, uh, a fully fledged theory of um, teleology in the uh, natural world that can help explain uh, the problem of mental causation. And I must say that uh, here, um, so th th this book is, is very big as I'm saying, and I, I will not present today or even give you uh, an argument or a single argument. Uh, I would just try to introduce his uh, theory of um, his theological theory, but uh, the book is concerned with, with many problems. So one of his central notions is the notion of absence absence being a category for entities that aren't there, that, um, that aren't physically, in a sense, visible uh, in a system, but are fully uh, determining, are crucial to understand the, um, how that system works. So in, in other words, the absences are future-oriented phenomena, right? And uh, they encompass the biological notion of function, a, uh, an intention, is an absence, a physical constraint. Uh, so there are many uh, phenomena that are future oriented uh, in some sense and uh, that are determining in some way the work that is done to make that future uh, possible, right? 
So uh, one said that uh, here's the um, here's the plan for today. So I will briefly um, talk about uh, historical problems of teleology, then um, the hypothesis. Um, what do I think uh, that needs to be explained? And then I will talk about uh, constraint work, basically to uh, introduce the notion of teleodynamics. Then I will move on to say how teleodynamics can explain uh, or minimally explain representation. And I will end up uh, drawing uh, some conclusions. Okay, so uh, the uh, you, you may probably be very familiar with this, uh, this section. So um, do you know that the uh, final course has is a difficult notion that has um, has had difficulties um, in the history of science and philosophy. So here's Francis Bacon in the 17th century saying that the final cause rather corrupts than advances the sciences, except such as to have to do with human action, right? And then uh, because it's such a uh, not so really difficult notion, um, but at the same time, uh, in my view, it's critical to understand nature. Uh, in some sense, it has been widely uh, misunderstood. So Francis Bacon argued that it is otiose and entirely speculative. Descartes famously uh, rejected it. So he thought that nature, that is to say inanimate bodies can be fully explained mechanistically. So uh, you don't need final courses to um, calculate the uh, trajectory of objects moving in, in space. So what's the role then of uh, final condensation in scientific theories? And then uh, Spinoza thought that it just, the notion reveals uh, ignorance of the true uh, courses of things. So in other words, that teleology can be or is a, a measure of our ignorance about nature. And then since the enlightenment uh, many had thought this notion unnecessary. Uh, why? Well, because there is only one form, one kind of causality, and that is the one that is driven by energy and force, and uh, everything else is unnecessary. So this is how Newton's theory was, was built with the idea on its, um, um, in the background that every genuine explanation must be uh, mechanistic. And that has had a big influence in our contemporary philosophy. And uh, I would say, although, you know, I wonder what the, uh, what you think about that, that the uh, situation hasn't changed much in the 20th century. So uh, we have had a collection of el eliminativist theories of um, teleology, such as Nagel, but Nagel, not Thomas, but Ernst Nagel, uh, Hempel, uh, teleonomic theories, uh, theories that argue that um, the uh, world can be fully explained uh, mechanistically, and this is how uh, teleology should be understood. So that's the view of uh, Pittendrick and Mayer. And then we have today a large collection of so-called um, etiological theories. So um, th th this will give for probably for a second seminar, but the um, etiological theory um, was um, first drawn up by uh, Wright, who actually wanted to recover the notion of teleology, but then the uh, theories that have been built on top of uh, right etiological theory, such as the selected um, effect view of teleology are um, largely uh, reductive. <clears throat> 
So uh, many of them have attempted to uh, explain teleology as functions or uh, products uh, of natural selection. Um, in other words, so uh, teleology is explained by natural selection. So why do we need teleology, right? And uh, well, this is, it, uh, of course, a uh, um, generalization. But I think that all of these theories are ways to uh, skirt around the problem of backwards causality. As you know, many uh, people complain that um, teleology is a notion that cannot be understood. But the reason is that it posits some cause in the future, which is somehow pulling the strings of current events towards its future. And that's basically a form of uh, what's causality that it's not easy to understand and therefore uh, we should get rid, so, uh, get rid of it. So etiological theories are attempts to um, recover, to get back to the idea that teleology can be and should be explained from events that uh, took place in the past and are not connected to uh, future events, to something uh, for which something is built. Okay, so I'll now uh, move on to uh, my, my hypothesis, right? So I've already said that none of these are, in my view, genuine attempts to understand teleology. That is to say, um, why there are what can call natural purposes in nature. So if you, you remember that Kant in his uh, critique of judgment spoke about forms of reciprocal causation. So forms um, that uh, engage in a means and relationship. So uh, he notes how in trees and plants, um, part of that tree or part of that plant works both as a means and, and an end, so that um, the mechanisms of the plant is a means for the so-called flourishing of the whole of the whole uh, plant, and in that respect, the whole plant is an end. So, and he couldn't find the way to explain that within the context of. Uh, Newton's mechanics. He thought that in some way, uh, Newton's mechanics was uh, well, not just incompatible, but, but unable to uh, explain those forms of causal uh, relationships. So he, this is why he thought that teleology is basically the teleology of an agent, right? Uh, teleology is external to nature. And um, but all these theories, right? So all this, uh, the, so the um, eliminativist, reductive, uh, etc. theories, none of them uh, genuinely explain why there are largely successful forms of organization that manage to resist entropy. And uh, well, entropy is an important notion here, and uh, it's critical to understand and Deacon's perspective on teleology, entropy can be defined as the tendency of things to uh, fall into messiness. And it is a, a consequence of the second law of thermodynamic that basically says that um, the, when energy moves from a state to another state, the capacity for work is reduced until the system gets to an equilibrium point at which no more, no more work is possible. So entropy has come to be a measure of the uh, disorder of a uh, physical system. Now, and uh, well, here's uh, Kaufman. Kaufman uh, is an interesting figure to understand uh, Dickens perspective and important from one of his books, this one from 2019, 
at APG is how the biosphere builds up complexity in the face of the second law of thermodynamics. This law states that in a closed system, disorder or entropy can only increase. In plants, photosynthesis builds up glucose molecules from carbon dioxide and water, fine. But if the second law degraded this order faster than it was created, no order could accumulate. So the question is, how does order accumulate? So in other words, if the uh, tendency to, uh, towards messiness of the second law is overwhelming, no order could be uh, created. However, as we, if we look at the natural world, the natural world contains order. So how can that be uh, explained if uh, nature has this um, overarching tendency towards uh, entropy? So my hypothesis is that life phenomena can only be accounted for in current forms of explanation if current forms of explanation are fundamentally augmented. I am a defender of a pluralistic causal theory, right? I don't think that we can understand nature if we only allow for a single uh, form of causality, the one of matter and energy. Um, interesting, well, this is a side issue, but there is an interesting article on the handbook, of the Oxford handbook of causation on pluralistic theories of causation, right? And um, the idea is that we, we need to understand how teleology is possible in a world that is also mechanistic. And uh, the, 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 the goal is not to replace mechanistic explanation, but to complement them with more complex causal forms, right? So the idea is not to say, right, that um, there is a conflict between mechanistic and teleological explanations. Not at all. You could look at mechanistic uh, teleological explanation as a necessary complement to understand certain uh, forms of behavior in nature. So what is my concept of teleology? Well, I would say that uh, teleology is a form of explanation that accounts for events that occur for the sake of something else. So I'm actually uh, borrowing Aristotle's definition of teleology, Henneke to phenomena, phenomena that happen, that occur for the sake of something else, right? So, and so there are two ways to understand teleology. One is extrinsic, that is agent-based teleology that could be said to be uh, the teleology of artifacts, artificial intelligence, uh, essentially everything that we humans uh, craft on the basis of a plan or a blueprint. And then we have the intrinsic view of teleology. And uh, I have called this view the dispositional view, uh, according to which, well, life phenomena are intrinsically teleological. But many times, uh, dispositional theories do not explain how teleology, in which sense teleology is uh, intrinsic to nature. So Aristotle, when he uh, explains teleology, he uses a um, extrinsic vocabulary, but uh, we know that it, that is just an analogy. So we know that uh, he many times argued that the acorn has a disposition to become a tree and that that disposition is internal. But my, my point here is that many people who wanted to understand teleology 
and not to reduce not to reduce it have adopted either an extrinsic or an, an intrinsic view and this has given rise to an opposing ways to understand how both teleology and cognition uh, can work together whether there is a, a possible continuity between uh, biology, which would represent the intrinsic perspective, and cognition, which uh, represents the extrinsic, right? So these Cartesian ways, in my view, uh, prevent us to understand how teleology operates. And uh, in this context, teleodynamics is a theory that explains how organizations become more complex, that it complexify, are more organized and self-stabilizing in the context of uh, from equilibrium dynamics, right? So borrowing from Schrodinger, the notion of negative entropy and how uh, life can um, resist or exist in that environment. And I would say that generally speaking, um, teledynamics is an Aristotelian theory, although it doesn't go all the way uh, with Aristotle. And then is different from the so-called organizational approaches, uh, which have been very successful in philosophy of biology, starting from Matt Rana and Varela all the way up to uh, Moreno and Mercio. The reason why uh, teleodynamics is different from those organizational approaches because it tries to show um, that how a system can be capable of the kind of constraint propagation that undergirds undergirds uh, um, these forms of organization. So this probably this cannot uh, yet be understood, but I will explain that in a minute, right? So I uh, will move now to um, constraint uh, work, right? So the, the notion of constraint also has been very uh, successful in the philosophy of, of science. Um, many people are using it and uh, Deacon uses it as a tool to explain novel and quite creative uh, ways of doing work in nature. But everything begins with a uh, basic spontaneous change. So we, we could define that change as the change that occurs by inertia or descent to a lower energy state when it is unimpeded by interaction with other processes, right? So um, spontaneous change in a sense is um, the change that occurs in the context of equilibrium dynamics. And the only thing that impedes or prevents uh, prevent it is a work, right? Uh, we can define work as a capacity to constrain energy really is. So for example, think um, about what happens inside a, an internal uh, combustion engine. So there is uh, gas expansion, right? So gas is somehow uh, compressed, that expansion is constrained, that it stays forced to go a specific way, which that gives rise to energy, and that energy in terms is harnessed to do work, right? So this is a form of uh, constraining energy uh, release um, using an engine or any other uh, human artifact. But there are ways of, uh, many ways of constraints, many kinds of constraints in nature. And I would say that contrariances are what introduce differences in change, right? So if you um, 
if you conceive of two possible thermodynamic systems, uh, which uh, such as, for example, two masses of hot and cold air, they come into contact, they have different um, constraints, uh, usually um, in a way the system tends to regularize. And uh, there is a point at which um, the system just gets um, thermodynamically flat. And, um, and um, this can be explained uh, by uh, the notion of constraint, saying that constraints reduce the degrees of freedom in a, in a system. So this usually explained by saying that they reduce or they limit the options of change, right? Whenever we introduce constraints, the possibilities of change within that system have been reduced. Now, the funny thing is that uh, constraints have more to do with uh, what is not done than what is done. Constraints are basically ways of preventing certain outcomes rather than causing them. And in a way, it's more responsible for what the system doesn't do than uh, for it, what it does. So it could be said to be ind only indirectly responsible for the kind of work that is being done. Now, constraints are a basic notion for, for uh, Kaufman, Stuart Kaufman. And um, he usually argues that it requires constraint on the release of energy to do work. And it takes work to produce constraints. In other words, that constraint and work necessitate each other. So the more constraint, the less entropy and the more order. So um, that if you introduce constraint uh, in a system, you augment the capacity of that system to do work by creating order. So in that sense, you could say that the acorn has a tendency to do work towards a specific end, which is the oak tree. And to do so, it has got to channel the energy, the, the release of energy using really complex chemical pathways. And it does it in a specific direction. Now that reminds me of Aristotle. Why? Because Aristotle says that matter can't exist unconstrained. There is no such thing as, un as unconstrained matter or prime matter. Uh, it's always uh, informed. Well, this is an analogous notion, but it only applies to uh, the notion of work. The work is always constraining the uh, release of energy. And the interesting thing is that life is characterized by is constrained on, on energy to uh, counter um, overarching thermodynamic tendencies towards messiness or entropy organism must do constant contrary work. In other words, they must do self-regularizing uh, work. And their work is used usually to build up order and regularities. You can say then that light creates order by also using self-organizing tendencies that are implicit in nature. So Deacon thinks that this is possible because there are three, generally uh, three kinds of dynamics in nature. The first one he calls homeodynamics, which is the uh, basic dynamic of uh, thermodynamics. 
The second one is more for dynamics, which is the dynamics of self-organization. The third one is teleodynamics, which is the dynamic of life or semiosis or uh, conscious and mental phenomena. Now you see here the interesting word or orthograde. Orthograde just basically means, this is sound piece of jargon, means that um, spontaneous, right? So that these are spontaneous kinds of dynamics. So thermodynamics just tends to the increase in entropy, more for dynamics or self-organization has got to do with uh, constraints, that is to say the capacity to do work and the amplification of those constraints with certain stability. Now we'll talk a, a later talk about teleodynamics, so I will focus on that later on. So this is another way, uh, this is a more uh, recent uh, slide that he sent me. Mm, so more dynamics is also a form of regularization, a way of dissipating uh, constraints that are uh, um, removing or destroying our work, whereas more for dynamics or self-organization can also be understood as regularization or active constraint generation. Whereas teleodynamics, we'll, we'll speak about that in a minute, is active constraint uh, preservation, right? But it, I just want to talk about this transitions. So for him, every level uh, describes a different type of change. So there are different uh, kinds of movement or tendencies in nature. And uh, the interesting thing is that different type processes can instantiate the same uh, logic so that you may have different thermodynamic morphodynamic and teleodynamic systems. There isn't just a single one, right? There are uh, several uh, movements or kind of movements in nature that answer to, may answer to uh, the logic of the three uh, levels. And he thinks them to, that they are dynamically uh, supervenient. Well, uh, supervenience doesn't have here very uh, strict, um, how to say, um, logical connotations. It just means that for the next level to emerge, so uh, the first level has got to be somehow assumed into the uh, dynamic of the uh, second level so that every level builds on the uh, tendencies of uh, lower level uh, levels, right? So, and the transition between uh, one level and the next level is marked by the emergence of unprecedented uh, forms of work. That is to say, uh, new uh, ways of constraining energy. And um, one interesting point of view here is that many times uh, when people speak about downward causation, so they speak as if there are different levels in nature, but they talk about that structurally. They think about how to reduce uh, components to inferior components. Deacon is not talking about that. He just saying that the next level is a change in the rules of how nature, how movement is organized. So we have only one, a single chessboard and uh, several games can be played with the same pieces, right? So what happens at the next level, at the uh, transition to the next level is that uh, there are different rules for the movement of those pieces and those rules make uh, every time more, um, so the, those moves are oriented towards uh, enabling work and work is complexifying, making itself more complex. And for Deacon, each level is irreducible to the next. That is to say, you cannot reduce 
senior dynamics to more for dynamics or self-organization. And you cannot reduce self-organization to, to more dynamic. You cannot just say, oh, everything is explained by equilibrium dynamics. Well, not at all. And we will see that in a minute. But before that, I will say something about more for dynamic processes, those processes which are spontaneous in nature and are the responsible for crystals, convection, will pearls, Bernard cells, and so on. So uh, many people know them as self-organizing processes. In general, you can say that they increase order, but they do so by maximizing entropy production. In other words, if you look at how a will pull uh, works, you will see that even though it produces uh, regularities, it also maximizes the rate at which entropy is produced. Why? Because it just becomes a way of destroying a constraint of uh, burning energy in a way. So these structures only last for as long as there are energy gradients. And if you took them seriously, well, they end up usually undermining the own boundary conditions, the conditions under which those uh, temporal entities uh, exist, right? Now, teleodynamics or um, the uh, work of teleology works very differently. Uh, even though this may sound really uh, complex and articulated, right, by talking about molecular processes and so on, in fact, Deacon in his book talks about very ordinary um, um, activities. So things that even though this process may be complex, they're also very familiar. So in some sense, teleodynamic work is what we must engage when trying to make sense of an unclear explanation. It is what must be produced to solve a puzzle, to persuade resistant listeners, or to conduct scientific investigations. In other words, I, as I speak, I'm doing teleodynamic work. I've got to do contrary work to some innate uh, tendencies towards obfuscation right, and try to introduce constraints to produce clarity. And that happens to many levels, not just in biology, right? So we're all training nature with some ends inside. So you could say that teleodynamics is a higher order form of constraint work that builds on self-organizing tendencies. So without the tendencies that are implicit in crystallization, Bernard cells, Wilpers, eddies, and so on, teleodynamics could not exist. Now, theory, uh, Deacon's theory is that teleodynamics is the result of two opposing self-organizing processes that cancel each other out. So, there's, so as I said, that uh, self-organizing processes usually tend to undermine their own uh, boundary conditions by, maxi by maximizing entropy production. Well, his hy hypothesis, which may be true, maybe not true, some people dispute it, is that they uh, get interlocked, they clash into each other, and they eliminate their uh, negative consequences. So if that happens, right, he says that there is a reversal of the previous dispositions in nature. They are usually self-destructive. Uh, and that happens because nature has innate capacity to channel energy and matter to do consequence organized work. In other words, functional work, work that is done for the sake of a consequence. Henegato are uh, following uh, Aristotle's theory. 
And in that way, cellular dynamics reflects the nature of processes that promote their own existence, that may make their own existence possible. Now, to see how uh, that can work, we can think about the way in which uh, constraints are passed on in nature. We could define information as constraints that uh, exist on top of chemical or molecular processes. And those constraints are usually passing on for, uh, from substrate to substrate using, using uh, different sign vehicles. So, um, you know, the, the classical example is gene expression. So how DNA uh, moves to mRNA to uh, finally uh, create a protein, right? Now that is a uh, really complex mechanism, right? That, um, you, that eventually what manages is to pass on the initial constraints of the uh, nucleic acid onto the uh, making of, of proteins. And, uh, and what happens there is that the work of those molecular processes that are uh, uh, all the way uh, downstream is organized to preserve and develop current and new sources of work. So that you could argue, although this is complex, but that what is carried forward by the system, by the organization, is the capacity to do work, right? So the capacity uh, to constrain energy of DNA is passed on using molecular mechanism, and of course using uh, more forms of work that are present in the whole organism to do work and to do work uh, for functional purposes. And in doing so, life, you could say, turns the second law against itself. So rather than increase entropy uh, production, it generates new and unprecedented forms of constraint that end up reducing this increase. And the increase is reduced to preserve uh, structural integrity. So, you could say then that teleodynamics is the maintenance of a capacity to do work that keeps entropy at bay, or in other words, a capacity to set up its own boundary uh, conditions that are uh, no longer uh, external. Now, um, yeah, well, this is another feature of cellular dynamics. So Zekon thinks that that system creates normativity. And normativity is um, an essential property of life. And uh, if you can think that that normativity has emerged from chemistry, well, then um, you could say, in a sense, that life is normative chemistry, right? And by saying that, that we can now say that the behavior of a system can be now judged according to some specific end. And its action to that end can be successful or not, or can be uh, just failed. And uh, without normativity, we can't have what uh, Kaufman calls the capacity of a system to act on its own behalf, right? So that is to say, the capacity of an organism to be uh, fully autonomous. So normativity comes coupled with agency, and therefore, if this is possible, the first teleodynamic system in some sense, mu must be an agent. Also, there is the rise of a beneficiary. Cellular dynamics processes are done for the sake 
of some kind of self, maybe just a very limited and physical self, but it's definitely an individual and an agent. And the uh, work that is, that is done for that agent has got to be distinguished from the benefit that a specific processes uh, may uh, pursue, such as, for example, oxygen or nutrient distributions in the case of uh, the circulation of blood in the organism. So functions have proximal benefits, but interestingly, they should have a, an ultimate beneficiary. Now, and here's the uh, model, right? So I'm, I know that I'm not doing too well uh, time-wise, so I will try to accelerate uh, a little bit, but uh, because this is all way too abstract, uh, Deacon um, devised the so-called autogen uh, model, right? And the autogen model is inspired by Stuart Kaufman idea that um, autonomous systems should have uh, to be truly autonomous in the context of our form equilibrium dynamics should have at least, should fulfill two conditions. What condition is that they should propagate the organization to uh, repair itself or create replicas or itself. So it should be able to of self-repair and re making uh, replicas or copies of itself. And then it must carry at least uh, a uh, work cycle. A work cycle is a, a movement by which uh, you do work, but then you come back to an initial state when that cycle uh, has ended, right? So that a system must be in um, Kaufman's view, the source of work and also its beneficiary. Now, uh, Deacon's idea is that um, if a very minimal uh, molecular system, right? You see here basically uh, blue and red molecules here. The blue molecules tend to uh, make up a container and the uh, red molecules are catalysts. So he thinks of a system that has, this is the combination of two morphodynamic processes. One that is autocatalytic, that is to say that tend to create, uh, so the, as you know, catalysis is a process that creates molecules of the same type. So it just, if you have those molecules in contact, they will produce more molecules of the same set. And then there is a, an opposing self-organizing tendency towards self-assembly, right? So that um, this system, this very simple system has two states. So one state is uh, at rest, the beginning, but then uh, a macromolecule or whatever crashes into it and then um, the whole content, the content is, is spilled. But because it's spilled, then the uh, catalysis begins and then more molecules are made. But then at the same time, there is an, an ten a tendency, all the things being equal, of course, towards self-assembly. And then the system reconstitutes itself. So, and then you have a system that just keeps going that way. It is broken, uh, spills its content, and then reconstitutes itself. So in a sense, it embodies this ratchet effect by which it moves forward, but then stops. Now, the interesting thing here is not so much what is going on with the molecules, but it, what is done with uh, what happens with constraints. In a sense, whereas this system is losing and gaining pieces all the time, 
constraints remain the same. It just keeps going, having its own constraints. So the, the system has both a capacity to uh, do work, to reconstitute itself, even if that work in a sense is the result of very favorable uh, external conditions. Now, the autogen model uh, can get really complex. So Deacon also has several uh, ways of complexifying the theory, just giving you the most basic one, right? But then um, as I move towards the end, and I will be really fast here, he thinks, though I understand this may be more controversial, that um, this system that is for the first time teleodynamic, although it's not alive, could be the origin of representation. And for that, I would say just two things. One is the following. Uh, on my idea that we need to combine both the intrinsic and the extrinsic, uh, extrinsic perspective of teleology, there is no end without representation. So uh, you have got to build in some way the extrinsic perspective into the intrinsic perspective to understand how teleology works. And uh, especially how teleology works in life phenomena. Uh, life phenomena, in a sense, are capable of representation. And you can understand representation as a form of constraint as I have argued that uh, most uh, mental activities are activities on constraints on possibilities, on real possibilities uh, that, are, that are done or not done or actualized or not actualized. So my argument is that to talk about indirectness as such isn't enough. You have got to explain how phenomena, very simple phenomena are capable to in some way represent future state of the systems for its own benefit. And uh, Kant or Topoiesis theory, teleonomic theories and so on, adopt a, an extrinsic perspective. Whereas I would argue Aristotle uh, Stephen Mumford, if you're familiar with him, adopt an intrinsic perspective. And the problem is that with just the extrinsic perspective, you fail to understand the realities of ends. Why? Because your view is external. So you have, you think that ends are basically in, in the human mind, they are not in nature. Whereas intrinsic perspective sometimes fail to understand or many times to explain representation. It's not clear how the future is represented. Sometimes it's just assumed that um, the Aegon is uh, pre-programmed and that the whole thing is just an unfolding of uh, genetic instructions. Well, we know that that's, that is a very simplistic view also from the biological perspective. So I think that we need to integrate uh, these two perspectives. And um, Deacon does that using um, pers symbiosis. So if you're familiar with uh, pers uh, system, uh, which I'm not fully familiar as I must say, but um, there are three levels of uh, symbiosis. One is the icon, second is the index, and the third one is the uh, symbol. Now, the hypothesis is that the first form of representation is iconic, right? And an icon is uh, characterized because of the represents, I mean, this is the signifier in Peirce's perspective resembles or imitates its signified object, right? And so you see it is how it comes to possess some of its qualities. So for example, here, everyone understands that this is uh, the Eiffel Tower, right? And that is because uh, there is something 
of the Eiffel Tower, right, in those uh, cartoons or uh, representation on my um, right, this is a calligram, right? So um, it, um, iconic relations are really easy to understand. They're present in cartoon, portraits, statues, sound effects, and so on. Now, yeah, I, I don't want to get into that because uh, I'm an, I may run uh, just for too long. Uh, so basically what I would say is that um, the uh, system that, um, let me go back to this system, right? In which uh, you see here the autogen and its constraints being preserved, um, being moved forward. Here, you could say that there is a relation of iconicity between uh, later and prior uh, states of the system that uh, you see that um, these two shells are isomorphic in a sense, well, in the deeper sense that uh, there is some constraint preservation uh, going on in the process. So, here, uh, I, I know that I have, I'm not explaining that very well, but anyway, what is going on is that the system is somehow representing itself, that it's managing to copy uh, its constraint uh, in some way. And so Deacon is arguing that that's the first uh, semiotic relation by using uh, Thompson vocabulary, I would call it, not Deacon, uh, significance, right? So he argues that, uh, Deacon argues that what takes place is the recursive self-representation of self-representation. The circularity by this description refers to the way which a part of the system is able to represent the critical constraints of the whole system of which it is part, right? So, um, Basically, if this is correct, uh, we could go deeper into that in the discussion, perhaps. This could represent uh, the minimal interpreting competence. But uh, mind you, this is uh, interpretation without cognition. Okay, so why? Because there is no cognitive subject here this teleodynamic system is not alive. It's just a simple molecular processes which embodies a particular kind of logic that understands, lets us understand teleodynamics, but it's not a real system. It is how uh, life might have emerged, but it is not uh, a living organism, although it has similarities with uh, viruses. But basically it's interpretation without cognition. And of course, there are here very difficult questions that I think I can only partially uh, answer. Well, how do we know that there is a real representation? That, you know, the presentation, this representation is such. This is not just happens by coincidence or, um, you know, contextual um, dynamics or whatever. Well, the answer to the question may be the system does functional work that is actually behaving teleodynamically. That is, the system is consequence organized. It not just happen to uh, make copying copies of itself as a uh, computer uh, usually does. Okay, so let me move on to the conclusion to uh, finish because there are more important points that I just want to uh, establish before uh, we move to the discussion. What is this um, that if you, uh, if you look at teleodynamics and um, I think that the, the theory maybe was still, uh, still in development. So there is one point uh, to make, I want to make, but uh, on the other hand, I think that it has, it has potential. And it has potential, first of all, to provide a teleological theory that is genuinely causal. That I haven't found that 
in contemporary uh, discussions on teleology. So this is the theory that explains how the dynamics of nature operates, how change at, a, at an incredible level of detail to which we haven't uh, gone in this presentation. So that is interesting. Why? Because many people, let's say, for example, most of Moreno and the uh, teleological, uh, their uh, teleological view, they think that teleology is just the result of fulfilling certain uh, conditions. And they would say, well, if a system has the closure of constraints, well, then it's teleological. If the system is autonomous, then it is teleological. But then you ask, well, what do you mean by teleology? What's going on in reality that explains teleology? And they would say, well, the closure of constraints and so on and so forth. But you say, well, what's going on in, in nature as a whole? What is the kinds of dynamics that supports teleological phenomena? And I don't think that there is an answer to that question, to those kinds of questions. So on the other hand, uh, it's a view that combine both the intrinsic and extrinsic perspectives, uh, as I have explained. And then it's a theory that in doing so, that in taking representation seriously, provides a possible solution to the problem of backwards causality, right? Which is actually which, uh, what scares people in the philosophy of biology. They think that teleology is problematic because he sets up, sets up, up phenomena that are established in the future and that are influencing, influencing current phenomena. So in this way, I think we can get rid of that threat. And also it's a theory that is scientifically tractable. Why? Because it shows how teleology can operate in the context of our uh, form equilibrium dynamics. And it actually uses that dynamics to establish itself. So in a sense, it needs physics and contemporary science to be uh, critically understood. On the other hand, the theory, as I have said, has its limits. So uh, it hasn't offered so far a full explanation of the explanatory gap which is actually the, the kind of gap that uh, drew me into uh, getting acquainted with uh, Deacon's philosophy of nature, right? That's still to be done. And on the other hand, I think that this can only be achieved when more complex forms of representation can be satisfactorily explained and uh, the emergence of first person perspective is explained. So in some sense, Jew could argue that in an emergentist or naturalist view, the first person perspective in nature has emerged. But uh, so far, dynamics is not explaining the subjective character of consciousness. Maybe the future it will, but so far he hasn't managed to explain it. So uh, thank you for uh, listening to me. Uh, I appreciate to have people uh, that uh, can listen to uh, as interested in this. And if anybody is interested in what I have argued today, he or she can read my paper on the naturalization of theology that uh, has been published this year in adaptive behavior. So thanks a lot.